Yeah, go see what other people have to say. Yeah. Yeah. Like, sweet, but. All right, let's rock and roll. Let's do it. Let's do it. It's going to be fun. Hello, everyone. Welcome to this morning's session of Socialism 2023, Doing More with Less, Asymmetrical Struggle. Uh, this session is sponsored by Hammer and Hope. There's literature about Hammer and Hope throughout the conference. Please check out their uh, issue number two, which just dropped, uh, which is fantastic. Uh, my name is Anthony Arnov. I'm a member of Tempest Collective. I'm an editor at Haymarket Books. I'm going to chair this session. Uh, I also want to acknowledge that we're live streaming this session. So shout out to the folks at home who are watching uh, this session with Olufemi Taiwo and Astra Taylor. I'll say a bit more about Astra and Femi in a moment, uh, but quick some housekeeping. Uh, in every session, uh, we just want to remind people that all socialism conference attendees are required to wear masks, fully covering the nose and mouth while indoors in conference spaces, including hallways and meeting rooms. Speakers from the front of the session may remove their mask in order to deliver their presentations, but only while actively speaking, and audience members are still required to mask even while asking questions or making comments. And there will be time in this session for folks to come to this microphone and and make comments, ask questions uh, after our initial conversation up here. The mask policy is in place to protect all of us, especially the immunocompromised from the risk of contracting COVID-19. The conference community safety plan relies in part on badge checkers at the door, thank you, Eric, uh, of each room, and all attendees are expected to wear their conference badges at all times to enter conference meeting rooms Please respect the badge checkers and know they're here to support a safe conference. You can see the registration folks if you have any problems. That's just on the second floor down a, a little bit. Um, so uh, I want to uh, start with uh, welcoming Astra Taylor to the panel. Astra is a filmmaker, writer, and political organizer and the author of an important new book, The Age of Insecurity, Coming Together as Things Fall Apart, which is based on her CBC Massey lectures. It's a really terrific lecture series if you're not familiar with it. Um, Noam Chomsky's Necessary Illusions was based on his Massey lectures, if you're familiar with that book. The book is publishing next week, September 5th, from House of Anansi, so please uh, be sure to get a copy of that. Uh, Astra is also the author of The People's Platform, Taking Back Power and Cultural in the Digital Age, and Democracy May Not Exist, But We'll Miss It When It's Gone, which is also a great documentary. Um, she wrote the introduction to Can't Pay, Won't Pay, The Case for Economic Disobedience and Debt a Abolition by Debt Collective, which she co-founded and is the author of Remake the World, Essays, Reflections, Rebellions. And both of those books are, are published by Haymarket and are available along with um, Democracy uh, May Not Exist, but we'll miss it when it's gone in the Haymarket's, Haymarket book room on the second floor. So get copies of those, and I, I suspect Astro would be willing to sign copies if you ask nicely. Uh, <laughs> Olufemi Taiwo is the author of two books, Elite Capture, How the Powerful Took Over Identity Politics and Everything Else, published by Haymarket Books, and Reconsidering Reparations, published by Oxford University Press. He teaches philosophy at Georgetown University, and his theoretical work draws liberally from black radical tradition, anti-colonial thought, German transcendental philosophy, contemporary philosophy of language, and contemporary social science, as well as histories of activism and activist thinkers. He is also on the editorial team of Hammer and Hope, which uh, uh, we're really uh, uh, happy to be collaborating with on this session today. So we're gonna talk a bit today about how to think, how to organize, how those two uh, topics are interconnected. Um, and I, I want to begin with a, a personal question for each of you, um, and that's to say a bit about how you think tactically 
and strategically about your own political commitments and your own choice of targets. Uh, and Astra specifically, I was hoping you could talk a bit about your work co-founding Debt Collective. And then Femi, uh, maybe after Astra kicks us off, could you talk about some of your recent work on public power, uh, which is the subject of a new roundtable uh, in Hammer and Hope? All right. Hello, everyone. It's such a pleasure to be here. Thank you, Anthony, for that kind introduction, and Femi for being in dialogue with me. Um, there's so many people in the crowd I can see that I know and admire or know of, and so there's so much wisdom in this room, I'm really looking forward to the, the Q&A. Um, and I also wanna say thanks to Hammer and Hope, which really is a great magazine everyone should, should check out. So, you want like the personal personal? Sure. Okay, all right. Um, I, I, you know, I'm one of those people who I guess in a way has always been an activist since I was a, a little kid. And, um, or had sort of political tendencies, and you know, I think um, was probably shaped by the fact that when my I'm from Canada, which is why I'm going there tomorrow to give these mass lectures, a very Canadian thing to do. But when I was about two years old, my family moved to Tucson, Arizona, and to the south side of Tucson, uh, which was actually uh, the water supply was uh, 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 poisoned by a Superfund site by military industrial waste. My sister was born with a physical disability. She's an amazing uh, writer and thinker, Sonora Taylor, who does a lot of disability rights work. And so I think that was like a bedrock environmental, con you know, gave me a kind of environmental consciousness. The bulk of the harm from this, uh, this pollution affected the Mexican-American South Side and the Tono Odom Nation. And there's just a very, you know, a real sense that, oh, there's environmental destruction happening. It has really profound consequences on human beings. Um, many people had cancer and were born with, with severe physical disabilities or babies were born without brains. It was like tens of thousands of people. And this was a kind of backdrop, just like reality. And, a, and a, um, a, my family was part of a long class action lawsuit, um, which I think made me very skeptical of legal strategies, right? You can't sue the bastards. <laughs> um, because you might get a pittance and that's supposed to be a victory. I think that fed what was a, actually a kind of ambivalence towards human beings. And so I was really into saving the animals, right? And I had a zine about animal rights and the environment and uh, railed against the grown-ups who I thought were misleading kids with their sort of pro-meat propaganda and destroying the earth. And so I think in some ways, you know, that's kind of the core of my politics in a way, um, or at least the, again, the sort of like childish for formation of them. As I got older, um, I got very into philosophy, not as into philosophy as family. I didn't quite, you know, get my PhD, but I, I was thinking that that was the direction I was gonna go made some movies about philosophers. So this is in the aughts. I made a film called Examine Life with some walks with philosophers and um, made a film about Slavoj Žižek when I was like 22 or 23. And, you know, kind of saw myself as working more in um, uh, culture and media. And, um, you know, was interested in, in politics and, and activism, but it kind of left that a little bit behind. And then the... Um, the financial crisis happened, and I started, I think, to, to think more deeply about um, Marxism and economics, not just as a sort of abstract intellectual thing, but as a way of actually understanding the injustices that, that you know, I was troubled by. And when Occupy happened, it just seemed like a tremendous, I, I sort of became involved, and it seemed like this moment to sort of, um, I, it was just like a pivotal moment for me, seeing all of these people come and, uh, you know, uh, for there to be an American moment that was focused on, on economics, I was talking about class, even if it was doing in the way of the 99% and the 1%. And at that moment, I sort of, you know, went back to that, that childhood impulse to like rail against the machine <laughs> that I kind of put aside to do more, I don't know, intellectual pursuits or cultural pursuits. And was like, at that moment, I was like, okay, I'm going to stop, um, you kind of almost like stop making movies or stop like, being in this level of mediation or something like that, I'm going to I'm going to organize and I'm going to actually um, uh, like do real, real work and and that was um, sort of put me on the path of of joining with others and building the debt collective, and the debt collective essentially is um, a union for debtors, 
And it's born of a sort of analysis of financial capitalism. This is des debt is incredibly central to the economy, right? We are all now forced to debt finance, which should be our basic needs. And in our debts, there is actually a sort of, there's both oppression and there's a potential source of power. And at that point, I'd come to the point of like, I'd come to the point of realization of like all the issues I care about from the exploitation of the earth, <laughs> from, you know, um, environmental racism to, you know, uh, what I found to be fucked up about our food systems to, again, the financial crisis, all of these stem from capitalism, right? So what I wanna do is find a way of building economic power that, that tackles that. Uh, and, you know, Occupy was this moment where, you, where um, you know, it was 2011, so there'd been 10 years of like no, no activism, really the, the dark period of the aughts where there was almost, you know, it was really hard to find like-minded people too, which is I think part of why I was like, I'll just make movies because there's not really movement energy. So Occupy broke that, I met so many people, I met a lot of people who are in this room even, and felt like, oh wow, there are other people I can do something with, build something that doesn't exist. And to go back to that like dichotomy I had where I was like, okay, I'm not gonna do, I'm gonna do real organizing, which is not this communication side. One lesson I've taken, or one, one thing I've learned, and I'll end here, is that that was a false split, that actually my work of communicating and writing books and making movies and trying to, bring ideas to a bigger audience is actually intricately connected with shifting political consciousness and getting people on the, on the road to organizing. Um, and, and to, you know, but I needed a target <laughs> that seemed credible to me to put my energy into it, right? And I think that what the Debt Collective has, you know, it's not the only group doing this, but it, it, it was compelling to me that we had an analysis of capitalism as it exists today, a way of connecting very abstract systems to people's lives, you know, your medical debt is a product of the fact there's no universal health care. Your student loans are a product of the fact there's no free education. Your rent is a, and your mortgage is a product of the commodification of housing. Um, and that we, and the tactics fl uh, flow from that, that sort of epiphany. Um, and, you know, and, you know, in the last decade, I think we've, we made a lot of progress, which I can go, go more into. But that is, that's, that's the Astro story in a nutshell. Yep. <laughs> yeah, uh, thanks, thanks everybody for being here. Um, yeah, as far as, uh, you know, what, what my kind of personal journey is with choosing tactics, I think when I got into, when I got into political organizing as an adult, I think I ran into this energy that maybe some of you have run into of, you know, the point of activism is to, is to fight to the good fight, to speak truth to power. And I think what's behind that is a recognition of what we're up against, right? You know, the United States has a very strong set of repressive institutions. It's got a police of, you know, and a military of world conquest proportions. And I think, you know, there's, there's a way of thinking, you know, that, that, that the only thing we can do is kind of lose nobly, right? And that what we're up against is here to stay. And I understand that energy. There's a lot of reasons for it. Um, but I've never really shared it. Um, and I think the reason for that is just the accidents of who I was around when I was growing up and what the circumstances were. But, um, you know, I was raised in a Nigerian American diaspora community by you know, people, the generation of my parents who had already like had the world change meaningfully lots of times in their lively, in their life for them. My parents were born colonial subjects of the British Empire. You know, my, me and my siblings were the first born after that. Um, and that was nine coups ago, <laughs> right? <laughs> like, obviously change doesn't necessarily mean for the better. Yeah. But, but the idea that this stuff is not settled, right, that things can be different f than they are, was the formative experience of their life, was the formative 12 experiences of their life, from the, from the coups to the um, winning of independence to the uh, immigrating, going across an ocean and living in a different social environment. Like, they were very aware that things could be different than they are, and they were unfortunately very aware that things could be much worse for them than they are, and you know, there's a lot of risk aversion and, and uh, insecurity that comes with that thought. 
But what also comes with that experience is thinking is understanding contingency, understanding possibility. So, you know, from my perspective, my interest in left politics has never been, you know, just kind of thinking that what we're up against is here to stay and the best we can do is just, um, is just, you know, speak truth to power while things stay the way that they are. I think we can change some stuff and that is what my attraction was to public power. And, you know, I feel vindicated and excited along with everybody else that there was this huge build public renewables victory in New York by all the people that did that work. <laughs> but before they won that, they knew that it was possible and they started figuring out how to do it as opposed to, you know, just kind of liking public power as an idea and speaking for it on principle. Like their thought was, what are, what are the power relations? What can we do about it? And I think the reason for even fighting that campaign is, is an even longer version of that. You know, if we win public power, what can we win after that? And that kind of, you know, st strategic long-term thinking that we on the left have often done in the past and I think I'm encouraged by the fact that many of us are returning to. Um, and so that's been, my, that's been my attraction to the public power fight, um, you know, the other people in We Power DC, um, which is uh, in DC DSA, are, have been, you know, working for that for, for years. Um, and I think we, as a group, can continue on that kind of trajectory in DC and in New York. And you know, you may be in a part of the world where maybe another fight is the winnable one, but I think the lesson isn't necessarily you have to do this specific campaign, but just, you know, it is a it is a very practical struggle we are engaged in, right? The other side has their resources, they have their team, they have their, you know, they have their politicians, and we have ours. And and the point of this panel is to start thinking, you know, very seriously on a tactical level, how we get to where we want from where we are, because we have to start from the premise that we can actually get there. And I think that's not something to take for granted. Uh, so Femi, you actually uh, crafted the title of this conversation. Um, and so I was hoping to ask you first, and then, and, and then you, if you could reflect as well, Astra, on how you think about asymmetry and why it's important to even bring that into the conversation. So I think one of the things that confronts most of us in most of the struggles that we wage, whether it's, you know, worker struggles against bosses, whether it's, you know, challenging uh, the city or the state or national level policy, whatever it is, is how deep the bench is on the right. Like, mm -hmm. you know, at the end of the day, I always waffle back and forth whether we're thinking that on the right, lined up against us is an incredibly crafty, incredibly sophisticated group of evil geniuses, or whether it's a bumbling group of people with all the guns and money. <laughs> and today I'm thinking it's the second one. Um, you know, like they have an all of the above strategy because they can afford it, right? Um, they, as private individuals, can afford to fund environmental research to astroturf grassroots campaign against education legislation. Um, they had a multi-decade plan to retake the federal courts. And, you know, they can just pay people to come up with this strategy. And they don't have to win all these fights it can be enough for them to just make us have to contest them on all these terrains and we will be outstretched and out-resourced before they will be. And you don't have to be brilliant to come up with that plan, um, which is great for them because <laughs> that's, not, you know, that's not what we're up against as far as I can tell. Um, 
but you know, even even besides the money part of things, I think actually one of the most crucial advantages that the right has is time. Right? They can afford to, you know, the meantime in between them retaking the federal courts, um, in between them capturing the presidency and forcing through tax cuts is, you know, a decade of waiting with the smaller yacht while they wait to be able to afford the super yacht that they can park the smaller yacht in, right? <laughs> like that's not an existential struggle for them. And so they can afford this kind of all the above strategy and afford to wait for change or just kick the can down the road. And that's been the, that's been the Exxon strategy, right? They didn't succeed in, in making climate denial established science. They did succeed in wasting 50 years and accumulating capital over those 50 years while the rest of us tried to, you know, convince the world that the sky is in fact blue and, you know, the science says what it says. So, you know, my question has, my question from a strategic perspective has constantly been, you know, what are the fights um, where we can direct our limited resources to that are likely to have kind of cascading, accumulating changes in the direction of actually politics that serve people rather than portfolios. Um, for a lot of reasons, I think public power is one of those, but it's not the only uh, version of that. Um, but I think, you know, we have to, I think it's instructive to think of these things as winning territory over resources so that we can get more time and money and research hours and all the things that we need to actually get the rest. Yeah, no, that's, yeah, I think, I'm like, okay, are they, are, are they just evil or are they geniuses? I mean, right now we're in a fight with the, uh, at the Debt Collective, you know, to try to um, protect the Biden student loan announcement, which was always inadequate from just a slew of right-wing lawsuits. And it's true, like one thing they have the ability to do is just sue in every possible court right, mainly with ridiculous arguments. Like, if they cancel student debt, we won't be able to retain employees at the Cato Institute, which is the libertarian <laughs> think tank. <laughs> you know, and if they can get a Trump or Bush appointed judge, right, then it's, then they're, they're gold. So, um, but even in that ridiculousness and that, that, that stupidity, like, they're, they're smart. They're using, they understand the law and how to use it to oppress people and to maintain their power. Um, Asymmetry. I mean, all good organizing stories are David and Goliath stories. We don't go around bragging like, I expropriated the kids with the lemonade table in my neighborhood. <laughs> like, you know, we want to fight the big bullies. And, and this is, this, you know, is a tough thing to do. Um, and I think the question, a way of reframing what Femi said is, you know, given a certain target, how big does our movement need to be, right? How, how much power do we need to be to move it? Um, and what's great about talking to a room full of socialists is we agree what the biggest target is, which is capitalism, right? So uh, that's a fucking big target. <laughs> and we, you know, it's hard to go straight at it. We have to, I think, take it piece by piece. And we, all, we need all sorts of people doing all sorts of things from all sorts of angles um, in, order to, or in order to move the needle. Um, I did want to reflect a little bit on a word that we throw around a lot at the Debt Collective, which is leverage. Leverage is an inter interesting word. I mean, there's so many beautiful words from finance that have been, sorry, beautiful terms that have been kind of co-opted by finance, like mutual funds or trust, <laughs> right? Like, we can, those should be our words, right? Um, and leverage is one of them, because leverage means using debt to get equity, um, uh, like, like private equity does leverage buyouts, right? So debt, <laughs> using debt to dispossess people, you know, using money you don't have to, to take hold of something and, and destroy people's jobs and their livelihoods is leverage. But you know, leverage, if we go back, if we, if we think about how we use it day to day, is you know, leverage is being able to have a kind of force multiplying effect. Right? You have a rod, and you are able to, to stand at a distance and move something that you wouldn't otherwise be able to move. Right? It's a kind of force multiplier. And so at the Debt Collective, one of our, our mantras is your debt is someone else's asset. Right? You know, it's our leverage, too. It can either overwhelm us if we are you know, alone, but if we band together and collectivize our struggle, we actually have leverage that we need to tap into. 
It was, and you know, there's a famous quote from Archimedes, which is, give me a place to stand and I can move the world, right? Like if we come together and we can think strategically about the leverage have, we have, you know, we can change the world. And I think in a tiny way, when you think of how tiny the debt collective is, we have done that, right? And so part of strategy is like, where are those leverage points so that the force I'm exerting, which is so overwhelming, I mean, it's hard to organize, it's tiring, it's like, so that at least I, it gets multiplied. <laughs> you know, where I picture a dam with, you know, you can just chip away at it and it's just like, oh my God, how am I gonna change this thing? But a few strategic holes can bring the whole thing down. So we wanna think about strategies in that way. Um, and you know, so the Debt Collective has a, a, a lot of examples, I think, that are, are hopefully you know, useful to people. But to kind of broadly categorize them, you know, think about what, what type of leverage do we have? Well, we have, you know, and I think this is something socialists are aware of, ideally we have economic leverage. <laughs> so workers can withhold their labor <laughs> and stop the flow of capital. We argue debtors can do the same by withholding their debts. But we also have um, political leverage sometimes. There are all sorts of laws on the books, all sorts of rights we have that are not respected. <laughs> and there are actually ways to kind of use those as points to hook into. There are protections we have to use those and, and, um, and, and get a toehold and build power around that. There is, of course, media and just like the power of ideas, right? We can shift common sense and shift um, consciousness around ideas. So everybody here knows what debt cancellation is, right? I think it's pretty realistic. Okay, that was not the case 10 years ago, even at the socialism conference, you know, and that is, that is a kind of power. And then I think there's also um, the power of disruption, which has always been the power of the poor, right? To just like fuck shit up and say no. <laughs> um, and we, I'd like to talk at some point in the panel about technology, which we think of as a force multiplier for corporate America mostly, but I think actually that we can use it, and the Debt Collective has some really good examples of using that to give us that leverage so that we have um, we have more force in our actions. Yeah, I definitely want to come back to some questions about technology and, and the kind of current forms of, of capitalism that we're confronting and, and what, what are some specific vulnerabilities that might create. Um, but uh, just quickly, I also want to say thank you for using the word tired, Aster, because mm -hmm. one of the worst cliches when you hear someone introduced is tireless activist. <laughs> Tired, Which, tired uh, activist. Yeah, tired activist uh, are the only ones that I know. Um, so let's talk about place for a moment um, because, you know, global capitalism and yet each of you is located in a, in a locality, in a region, in a state. Astra, you're actually someone who works in a couple of different geographic locations and also historically, um, Canada and the United States as, as kind of national frameworks for your work. Um, so uh, I would like you to talk a little bit, maybe you starting us off, Astra, about how you think about, you know, where you stand, where you're rooted, but also having these other uh, broader frameworks of understanding politics. Mm, yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, I think the question of, of scale is a really interesting one. I think one thing that excited me about the debt collective, you know, when we were just beginning to think about it and just beginning to lay the groundwork, was that, you know, I felt that we were consciously pushing back against what had been a major trend, not so much on the left, but like liberal circles of, we just need massive email lists, right? So kind of the move on model, like we're gonna have millions and millions of people send a petition, right? And, and constantly want more and more signups and, and more and more, you know, not even members in a meaningful way, right? Not, not really organizing, but, but names. Um, and, and we still have that, where we're like, millions of people showed up at a protest for one day. <laughs> and, I, and I was like, okay, I'd rather have less who are doing more, right? Have, have, like, let's try to build something that's more about depth than breadth, right? I'd love to have depth and breadth, that would be the ideal, but if I've gotta choose, you know, I'd take, you know, a thousand really committed people over, a million people who sign a change.org petition. And, um, you know, and I think there's some hubris in that because we're like, yeah, with a really small committed group, we can go up against the debt machine. <laughs> and one of our, um, you know, we began laying the groundwork for the current, you know, broad-based debt abolition framework by, by honing in on predatory for-profit colleges, specifically a collapsing school called Corinthian Colleges Incorporated. These are schools, you know, when we think of colleges, we often think of Harvard or Yale, that sort of like 1,000, 2,000 students. 
the University of Phoenix has like 100,000 students or something, right? Because they are, they're operating at a scale that's actually not place-based. It's, it's national. They, they probably have actually schools in Canada. Um, and anyway, something always worth naming is that the Obama administration was actually build, bailing out this predatory company <laughs> that was collapsing under the weight of its own fraud and facilitating its transformation into a nonprofit in order to deny debt cancellation to these people whose lives had been fucking ruined, right? Just right, this was right around, you know, soon after the financial crisis. So we coupled a legal strategy asserting a little known right called defense to repayment, which is the right to get debt cancellation if, you're, if you have been defrauded by a school, if your school has violated the law. This was like a tiny little provision and a reauthorization of the Higher Education Act from the 90s that like three paralegals had tried to assert with no, no luck. We coupled a legal strategy that allowed people to submit digital disputes effortlessly on their mobile phones, knowing that many people who had gone to these schools didn't have computers, let alone printers at home, right? So knowing there's a digital divide. With a militant strike of only 400 people, uh, sorry, not even 400, 15 people, the Corinthian 15, 15 people saying, our lives have already been ruined by this debt. We're going on strike. And it was the first ever debt strike. Um, and so had this sort of, you know, bold strategy of debt refusal that was just 15 people in the beginning. That grew, it grew to hundreds and then thousands and then grew to other predatory for-profit colleges and now has grown to student debtors um, in mass. But that was enough um, coupled with, again, engaging the media, trying to shift the con consciousness of people to make inroads and force the Obama administration to begin issuing a trickle of relief. So what we thought was pretty amazing, right? Full debt cancellation here for hundreds of people, then thousands of people. That, that was halted under the Trump administration because Betsy DeVos's, one of her two priorities was destroying borrower defense, which is you know this ability to get your debts canceled if you've been uh, subject to fraud. But in 2022, in June of 2022, the Biden administration announced basically met our d demands from the beginning, which was the full automatic immediate cancellation of debt for every Corinthian student, right? <laughs> so. So you know, this was to go to your your question of of, of place. You know, this is you know, part of the, the challenge of tackling financial capitalism is it's like everywhere and nowhere. <laughs> and for us, it was about following those chains of debt, which in this case went through you know private companies and also the government, because that's neoliberalism, right? Is that those things are often overlapping, and and trying to make these big abstract systems you know concrete to people, and they are concrete because they manifest every month when you have to pay your bills. Um, and, you know, so, you know, I think, you know, strategies have to, um, you know, part, a lot of the time, at least if you're dealing with financial matters, it is about kind of making these invisible systems visible. And ultimately, these systems are international, right? Um, and one thing we're now, you know, we've always known this, the debt collective, but it's become much more concrete is, you know, a lot of our opponents, whether it's medical debt, you know, um, housing or, or education, you know, are these private equity investors, right? <laughs> There's actually, we have similar enemies across, um, across these debt types. And in fact, one of the, uh, I'm blanking on the name now, but one of the people bankrolling the, case, the legal cases to stop student debt cancellation, is like a major investor in corporate housing, right? And, and our housing um, organizers are actually organize, um, uh, working on possibly targeting them. So it's like, you literally, um, when you follow when you follow the threads, it's like, wow, man, it's a small group of people fucking over everybody in a lot of different ways. Yeah, I, I don't have too much to add to what Astrid just said, but but maybe maybe I'll just add in, you know, the local is not that local, and and I think that's one of the most important things to learn about things like the Corinthian fifteen, you know. One example I always give my students is that you know the Protestant Reformation, you know, a huge change in how people practice religion on multiple continents started off with like one listicle on the door, yeah. right? Ninety-five <laughs> things that piss you off about the Catholic <laughs> Church, right? And it's not you know the thing that is distinctive about local organizing is not that like you exist in this enclave where only the things happening in the zip code matter. 
it's that that's the scale where you can build actual personal relationships. That's the thing that's important about local organizing and the solidarity of those 15 people to not just say we oppose, we are angry about this thing, but we are going to pursue a political strategy and we are going to stick to that strategy together and we are going to draw other people into this relationship of striking together. That's the thing that makes, that's, that has to necessarily starts out local in a sense, but becomes the kind of thing that can challenge an entire national administration. And I think that's a lesson to take. Uh, I think we would be remiss if we didn't take a moment to talk about the impact of NGOization and the kind of nonprofit industrial complex in which we are increasingly having to operate uh, or increasingly has a certain kind of influence on, on social movements. Um, you've both written critically ab about these dangers. Uh, and, and Femi, I think, you know, for folks who haven't read Elite Capture, mm -hmm. it's such an important book. Um, I think it would be helpful for people who aren't familiar with it, Femi, if you could say a little bit about the kind of framework that you're trying to develop there and the kind of constructive politics you're trying to develop there and how that helps inform how you think about the problem of NGOization. Um, so if we can maybe start with you and then, and then kick it over to Astra. Yeah, so, so maybe I'll just say a couple of things. So the basic idea of elite capture is um, a pattern you see in politics is that the most organized and well-resourced uh, fractions of a group of people, even within marginalized groups of people, even within social justice movements, um, the most advantaged fractions tend to end up not in, not just in control of the monetary resources, not just getting the most grant dollars and nonprofit dollars, right, but also the political direction of the movement. Um, and so, what might start out for might start out as a you know, very radical movement for queer liberation might end up focused on marriage equality, you know, those kinds of mission drifts, right? And that is a thing we see not just, you know, that's a thing we see in many different kinds of politics. I'm not just um, trying to single out the marriage equality movement um, by any means. Um, that's just an example. But it's a thing that, we have to think about when we're thinking about what kinds of organizational structures are given central authority in you know, the movement ecology. Part of the reason why I think it makes so much sense for us to be so focused on the labor movement, for instance, is not just that we are socialists and we are for the working class, but also because that is a structure that at least in principle can work on radically democratic, um, a radically democratic model. One member, one vote, rank and file led strategies where people have to come together in a genuinely democratic fashion, just decide what we're going to fight for, what we want in our contract, what we're going to strike for. And that is not the model that is built into nonprofit organizing, phil philanthropy, you know, funders have a kind of influence that, you know, there isn't a clear analog for in, you know, a dues paying rank and file led membership model, right? So that is a political problem that we have to answer, but preferring one kind of organization to another is not going to you know, make the good organizations, it's not going to by itself get us the level of union density that we want, right? It's not going to by itself um, give the existing unions the exact political direction that we want. Those are things that we have to fight for by actually engaging in that sort of organizing. Um, and like, look, it's the 21st century. We don't have an interventionist Soviet Union. We don't have, you know, the same uh, level of intervention from Cuba, like these were big deals in the 20th century for actually getting real resources to the kind of left politics that I think we're trying to pursue here. And 
in a different geopolitical climate, uh, we're going to have to find other ways to provide resources to the kinds of politics that we're looking for and the kinds of political organizations that we're looking for. Yeah, I mean, I think Femi basically said it all, but to invoke Cuba, I mean, look at Cuba's approach to vaccine development and distribution. They developed a vaccine relatively, you know, amazingly, actually, cheaply, and then made it widely available versus the Gates Foundation, right, which helped sabotage the um, open distribution of an early vaccine in favor of an intellectual property regime. So I feel like that sort of gets at it. And, you know, and the reality is right now for the debt collective, like, we get grants. We aspire to get more grants. But we've also been told by program officers that our proposals hurt their trustees' feelings, and so we would not be getting funded <laughs> because we were saying that the financial system harms people. <laughs> And they are not hurting people on purpose, okay? So, <laughs> yeah. I mean, if we want to have, you know, it, this is why unions are so threatening. This is why they've been so, this is why the, the fight on labor unions is so intense. Why so much money is directed at that is because these are, in theory, you know, organizations that are beholden to uh, their members and not the donor class. And that's a really powerful thing. Uh, I want to share uh, some reflections from Kinga Yamada Taylor in, in her essay that just came out in Hammer and Hope, and and just throw them out for your reflections on on what they might mean for you, and in particular, um, what kind of institutions we're building, um, and, um, and what kind of institutions we might aspire to build um, collectively. So this is uh, from Kianga's uh, essay. Only through collective struggle can we fundamentally change this social order. But when it comes time to decide what to do about the situation and how to achieve social change, we lack current answers. She's kind of describing this current political moment. A new left will not just be willed into existence. We must organize and build it together on the basis of radical politics. I'd just love to hear how each of you thinks um, about what that might mean in your own work and the kinds of institutions you're building or w think we ought to consider and talk about building. You want to maybe start, Femi? Um, so, so let me just give four examples or four types um, of institutions or movements or projects that I think are worth thinking about. Um, so we could start off with projects that are directed at trying to challenge formal institutions. We could challenge them at least to some extent from the inside, so try to pressure politicians or even elect politicians to get um, a particular piece of legislation passed. Maybe the Build Public Renewables Act in New York is a good example of this. And then the kind of institutions, the kinds of groups that push for that are you know, coalitions of ideologically aligned groups. So in, in the BPRA campaign, that would be DSA Eco-Socialists and Sunrise and uh, the unions, the teachers unions that signed on um, and building trades that came later. Um, and those kinds of, that kind of partnership. So building the coalition of partners who want public renewables to push the governor and the state assembly to do the right thing. You could also be worried about trying to get formal institutions to do something different, but have a more outside focused strategy for that. So. Um, my understanding is that Philly DSA was doing something like that strategy with the Corsi Rosenthal boxes. So they would build kind of, you know, essentially low, essentially low tech air filters for schools and use that one to give kids clean air where they had the boxes, but also to essentially shame the government into actually doing their job as opposed to um, this outside group doing their job. Yeah. So those are two examples that are kind of directed at 
centrally at trying to put pressure on the state on formal government institutions um, and two strategies for doing that. But you could imagine um, different strategies entirely that were more focused on the outside part of the inside outside distinction. Um, so in the Hammer and Hope issue, we talked with um, some organizers from the landless workers movement in Brazil um, and they pursued, you know, a kind of DIY land reform strategy where um, you, you see some vacant land, um, someone out there has a piece of paper saying it's theirs, but now you have a farm on it saying that it's yours, right? Um, and that is a strategy that might involve talking to the state later, maybe to, you know, pressure them to recognize your land claim, but the initial kind of impetus is getting people, is more the direct action style, just getting people onto the land, cultivating the land, building solidarity with people around it. Um, and that's a more um, outside confrontational strategy. And then finally, the, the fourth example is a more prefigurative strategy. You know, we could just start actually building these systems that um, we want to see. So my example for this is Puebla Pueblo, which is being done a, a food justice, food sovereignty strategy being pursued by um, the countryside in um, outside of Caracas and a uh, Afro-Colombian neighborhood in Caracas. And they're just directly meeting to decide to decide to plan out on a uh, people planning basis, the food system. The people in the city uh, talk about, you know, what kind of food they want and the food producer cooperatives and distribution cooperatives um, also meet to tell, you know, what their production needs are and what their costs are and they figure it out together and then they're just building an alternative food system kind of outside of the existing institutions. So these are all lanes that we could go in and I think you know it's gonna be tactical rather than theory reasons that we should go in one direction rather than another. But these are you know just some of the ways we can think about uh, building institutions and building networks of people. Yeah, I, I think that's a really helpful breakdown. I mean, my immediate reaction to King is great piece, which everybody should read. Um, you know, is that we can we do need to build new institutions, but we also can change ex institutions that exist. You know, and unions are one of those things, right? We want to democratize unions so that they can be better agents of transformation. Um, you know, my favorite example of this in history is um, uh, this Quaker activist Benjamin Lay. Who's heard of Benjamin Lay? Yeah. Um, Marcus Redeker wrote an amazing book. He's born in, Benjamin Lay was born in like 1682 or something like that. Uh, you know, absolutely humble origins. He was a little person, so had a kind of hunchback, a disability, um, worked briefly as a sailor, and eventually found himself in Pennsylvania, was Quaker, and just went on a one-man <laughs> mission to uh, make abolition, the abolition of slavery, central to the Quaker tradition. And he did this, you know, and that was a strategic target, right? Because now we know how essential it was to have Quakers be abolitionists, <laughs> looking back on history. And he did this by just, he basically was like a, one of the inventors of guerrilla theater. And he would just do these theatrics relentlessly. I mean, for years and years and years that forced this moral discussion in the community and, and polarized the community and, and set the stage for, um, uh, for um, the, the renunciation of slavery. So for example, you know, he took these you know, teacups, like you know, nice teacups out, he would set up a table in the street and just started smashing them into bits and denouncing exploiters in India who were harvesting the tea and slavery, you know, which, which, uh, created, uh, which produced the sugar. And the whole, everyone in the town square just starts freaking out, wants to save the China, right? And he's like, you're making my point. You know, they carry him and just throw him, or he's kicked out of the, the, the church and so then he just lays at the door. So they have to walk, everyone has to walk over his body as they exit. <laughs> I 
exit church. You know, and, and so he was effective. So once in a while, I just think he's a great example of a kind of asymmetrical struggle. I also love him because he was a vegan <laughs> 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 who lived in a cave and wrote one of the first books against slavery. Um, it's my kind of weirdo. So, um, but you know, we do want to build institutions and we want to build them on the basis of radical politics, but we don't want to build them just for radicals. Right? Yeah. I think that's really important. Yeah. We want to, you know, so it's like, you know, so, so, and that's really important, you know, to have, have a socialist horizon and that clarity that we need, a deep transformation, but always be working to invite people into the organizing and the organization. And I, I know that Kianga would, would really ag agree on this. And we can do that, I think it's worth thinking about tactics <laughs> on that front a little bit. And maybe I'll say something about the, the technology po point. You know, the debt collective is really small, so how, how can we multiply our force? And one way we've done this, I mentioned already the defense to repayment tool, right? So one thing that neoliberalism does is it just overwhelms us with bureaucracy, right? Just death by bureaucracy. And in fact, we saw this when, when the pandemic started and people could not apply in Florida for unemployment insurance because they had designed the website <laughs> to be unusable. Right? And this was articulated clearly. This is not a conspiracy theory. This was by design. And in fact, you know, so we built this defense to repayment tool that people could use really easily on their phones. We overwhelmed the Department of Education with these applications, started a, a crisis. And in fact, the Department of Education was under Obama basically just took our app and put it on their website and was like, okay, stop going through the debt collective. Right? We, the government, are going to take this anarchist app <laughs> and put it online. When Trump took office, $90 million was allotted to redesign the borrower defense application portal. And a whistleblower came forward and said the redesign was scuttled because it was too user friendly. Hmm. Right? So we have repeated this technique of making tools to kind of provide a direct service provision. We're going to meet your needs, help you get your debts canceled, or, and other things I'll talk about but then bring them into a collective action, right? And, you know, resisting that individualization. So one way we do this, we, we've launched something called the Tenant Power Toolkit in California. So in California, which is supposed to be, you know, a very progressive place, it's actually very tough on tenants, very landlord friendly. You can go to the, the state uh, or county website if you're a landlord and have a handy dandy like eviction tool, like evict my tenant, you know, three easy steps. There's nothing like that for tenants. In fact, if you get eviction papers, you have five days to answer your eviction or else you'll lose your case by a default judgment, right? So we built a legal tool that basically interviews you and creates a very detailed answer and e-files it in LA County. So now the debt collective with a staff of like one and a half <laughs> is submitting one out of five of all of the answers in LA County, right? And over the last, yeah. <laughs> has basically you know, kept the eviction at bay for t about 10,000 people, we estimate, probably more. Right? And these are people who otherwise would be seeking legal aid, like one lawyer at a time, probably not finding one because those kinds of lawyers are overworked. And so using automation right, in a smart strategic way that makes us, um, that, that, that multiplies our impact, but also enables us to meet people's real needs so we can bring them into a radical organizing initiative. And in that case, it's a collaboration with um, the LA Tenants Union. We also have a new tool, the student debt release tool, that is something that everybody who has student debt, no matter from where, if it's from Harvard or from the University of Phoenix, should fill out and apply. It's based on a similar theory of the bor uh, borrow defense tool. Um, and as an organizer, I would be you know, remiss if I didn't make an ask of you. So please fill out this form. Tell your friends and family about it. Uh, you know, about, we released it only a few days ago. Something like 11 or 12,000 people have applied. And it, uh, it basically sends your petition directly to the five top, the top brass of the Department of Education into their personal inboxes. Um, so we encourage you to actually write a follow-up email um, on top of it because they might be filtering out the debt collective into their spam folder at this point, but they won't be filtering out your personal message, so. So I have one uh, last question before uh, I'll bring in audience participation. So if folks do want to um, ask a question, um, line up behind the mic here. Um, and I would just ask that you keep comments and questions on the brief side so we can get more folks uh, participating. Um, 
But I would love both of you to reflect a little bit about how you think of doing political education work along with your organizing work. We, we have a limited amount of time. <laughs> um, there's always trade-offs, um, but uh, I think both of you do center political education in interesting ways. So how does that work into your organizing practice, and how do you think about the um, doing both question of, of, of activism and, and learning? I'll, I'll just say something quick, which is that there is a, I don't know, I can be, I can be slightly rude about this because I'm an academic. Um, <laughs> but I mean, there is a version of political education which is like a way of being able to facilitate cooler conversations with radicals. And, mm -hmm. and I'm a nerd. I love reading books and just talking about oh. books. And <laughs> it's, it's fine. Like, I don't have any problem with that in principle. But I think it's worth distinguishing, you know, just being weirdly opinionated about the Mensheviks versus, <laughs> like, political education in the sense that's keyed to a particular struggle. So, you know, I, I think one thing that's been really helpful has been um, the political education um, that a lot of chapters have been doing around, you know, what is the energy system like, right? Mm -hmm. um, why is it that we're pursuing, you know, the particular strategy that we're pursuing? What, what are they doing in Nebraska? Why does that work? Why do they have public power throughout that state, right? And the version of education that's actually keyed to practice and not just hypothetical practice, but the practice that you are doing, I think is not the only kind of political education that we should focus on because we want to have the larger vision, the larger clarity of where we want to go after we win the thing in front of us. Um, but it is a way of grounding ourselves in an attitude towards education that isn't, you know, a finishing school for radicals, but like is, yeah. you know, is something that we see as tied to where we want to end up eventually, which is self-determination, right? That's one of, that's one of the reasons socialism is such a good idea. You know, we want people to be in charge of their lives and we want people to be in the practice of making decisions about their lives. And if we actually want all this stuff we're fighting for, all of this stuff would be up to us, not just mm -hmm. how the energy system works, mm -hmm. um, but how every other part of our social system works. And so starting to build those habits through organizing is, I think, an encouraging approach to political education. Yeah, I'm really, I, I agree. I mean, you know, I was talking about my, my false dichotomy between my writing and communication and organizing and, and, and realizing that that was misguided. I mean, I think political education is so key within the framework of an organization so that you can, um, you know, know why it is that you're, why, why you're doing what you're doing and how that can build to the next step, right? You know, it's, it's through political education and larger consciousness that you know that you're not just, you know, striking for your own benefit, for your own wages, but know when and where to engage with, with other struggles. Um, you know, at the Debt Collective, Lots of people want debt relief, right? You don't have to be a socialist to want debt relief. Um, but we'd like to use that as an opening into a broader political consciousness. And I think it, you know, our work has shown, I think, that it's a really, a really generative one. Um, and a lot of people stay in the organization after they have been liberated from these debts because they want to fight for others. And they see the connections between other, other types of oppression. We've had organizers with our, for example, our for-profit college campaign who went on to organize at their workplaces and organize a labor union, for example, right? To me, that's a huge victory. They don't have to stay in the debt collective, but they've gotten this bigger consciousness. Um, I do think, and, and this is to your point of self-determination, our political education has to be democratic. It can't just you know, be that model of like, well, we are the people who know things and we are opening your brain and inserting the information in the, the politically correct right way to think. Um, and that means you know both engaging without condescension and speaking in terms that don't intimidate and that invite people in to a conversation and also being aware that like we don't actually know everything <laughs> you know as the train changes we have to keep reassessing we also make mistakes and have to acknowledge that and i think a little bit of humility 
a humility goes a long way, which leads me to my dig at academics, actually. <laughs> you know, which is, you know, the political education isn't just for them, our members. I mean, it's for us too. And I really resist the theory practice dichotomy. I mean, for me, you know, and, and this is how I think the interplay of my work really, you know, is, is personal. It's like you theorize and then you try to organize and try to put your ideas into practice and you learn from that, <laughs> right? And then you step up and you reflect some more and you try something different. And then you learn from that process. The doing is thinking, the doing is learning, you know? And these are not separate realms. And you know, you're a better, I think, a better analyst and a better intellectual the more you have skin in the game and you know what's actually going on. So uh, please come up to the microphone if you have a comment or question. As I said, on the shorter side, we might get a couple more people in. I also wanted to mention that that Marcus Redeker book that, that Astra spoke about Love is it. available <laughs> in the Haymarket Books room. Yeah. Comrade. Hi, thanks so much for that. <coughs> Very uh, interesting. Um, this question is uh, mostly directed at Astra, but also uh, if any, I'm interested in your thoughts. Um, I'm a, I'm a practicing lawyer, I, I represent tenants, and I also happen to have a one labor union client. A lot of the time, I uh, recommend, I have a lot of activist clients, I recommend against legal strategies. Mm. They tend, in my experience, to zap the energy from a movement. It's very hard to maintain the energy over the same time frame as a, a legal yeah. battle will last. Um, also directs, uh, sucks up resources, um, energy, uh, um, attention, and then you're also being invited into an arena that is fundamentally uh, yeah. um, much more disadvantageous, it's uh, fundamentally a asymmetrical. I'm interested, though, I did hear uh, from you, Astra, um, you know, reference to a number of different legal strategies that you've tried successfully. I'm wondering if you have thoughts on how to think about when it's appropriate to use uh, legal strategies. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, it, it, and also the other uh, last point I would make is that a lot of times those, you know, victories in, 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 the, uh, um, in the legal arena are, are not very significant. Yeah. Uh, in, in Canada, for example, about six or seven years ago, the Supreme Court um, uh, recognized the right to strike and the right to organize uh, as a fundamental right. You haven't seen any increase mm. in labor activity, militancy. Um, I, I wouldn't say you could discern any measurable effect on um, wages or uh, anything like that. So to me, that was a very empty battle that, that was ex enormously expensive um, and, and, and probably dis distracted a lot of um, attention. Mm. Yeah, no, I really, I thank you for that. I mean, I think you kind of answered the question in your question. <laughs> I mean, because I agree. You know, I, I, I'm thinking back to the early days with the, the Corinthian students we're organizing with, and their instinct rightfully was, we were defrauded, we should sue. In that case, they had all signed arbitration agreements. Often the school, as they were about to walk for graduation, would say, you can't walk for graduation unless you sign away your rights to sue. I mean, what we're seeing right now is the massive privatization of public law with arbitration in every um, corner. I mean, we are all, we're all signing arbitration agreements all the time. We basically have to. And so that was interesting, because then we're like, you can't sue. So we're going to have to figure out something else. So I said legal strategy in a kind of vague way. Sometimes I just mean like w pertaining to the law. Like we found some law, a law that should be working for working people, but isn't. And so we're going uh, we're gonna to say, we're going to almost naively be like, but the law is on our side. <laughs> wow, what if we believed it? <laughs> right? False. Like, False. Right. right. <laughs> We got it. Sometimes you got to be like, wow, you know, we have the right to strike. Like, we're going to do it. And so that, and there have been, um, you know, the Debt Collective is, we are, one of our co-founders, Luke Karen, who's a brilliant, uh, brilliant law professor and helped kind of think of some of these things. But yeah, we haven't, you know, we've um, helped people who are doing the, the cases, right? And they're sort of public interest lawyers and occasionally helped with affidavits or with evidence and stuff like that, but we absolutely agree that mostly legal battles are a distraction from the, the power building that we need if we want those legal victories to actually have, to have teeth, right, and to have the consequences. And I would, you know, I just have to name the Supreme Court, mm -hmm. yes. right, which just struck down Biden's 100% legal student debt relief plan to the point where Justice Kagan, in her dissent, said, 
you know, something, she said something historic and alarming, which is my, my colleagues have violated the Constitution in this decision, mm -hmm. right? They have violated the Constitution by striking down a legal action by the President of the United States. And that, we know, abortion, <laughs> the gutting of the EPA, right? This is the, the law is not on our side. That is really clear. And it makes the building power that much more urgent, for sure. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, thanks, um, both of you. I'm Leika, a member of Workers' Voice. You guys talked about building radical institutions. I really appreciate the framing of, like, based on radical politics, but not only for radicals. I wanted to ask you about um, building like class independence and uh, independent party. Like that's you know not the Republicans, not the Democrats. And how do we like? It's something I feel like so many organizers think about. But where does that moment where all these campaigns, all the organizations, like catalyze into a, a new political party? Yeah, I think. I think the I think the crucial question is the moment, right? Because right now we have a lot of independent, in one sense or other, um, unions and nonprofits and ideological organizations, um, and these kind of piecemeal things that are at least formally outside of party politics. Um, and you know the question. And I think we need to maintain that, right? Um, I don't think, yeah, it isn't my, it isn't my opinion that there should be coordination with any party, including the Democratic Party. Um, but I think, as far as starting a workers' party goes, I don't know. I don't know what the moment is where you have enough where you have a robust, you know, and I think that's the question, I think that's the question we're asking, right? I don't think my, I don't think the sides are, you know, are we really Democrats or are we, um, or are we something else? I think m most people that I interact with think that we need to be at least, that we need to have organizations and structures that are, independent from both of the parties, but when those things can coalesce into a party of their own, that I don't know. Um, maybe someone here does. Yeah. Well, and coalesce into a party of their own that's big enough to actually constructively engage the American electoral system, which is a deeply fucked system. It is a winner-take-all presidential system and not a parliamentary system, and those are the incredibly anti-democratic, oligarchic rules that we're under. and. You know, I think this is why at this point, given the state of the left, like we're bigger than we were 10 years ago. We are not big. I don't think an independent third party that has sort of electoral ambitions is the best use of our limited time. When we're thinking about the deep asymmetry we're facing right now, my vote is focus on base building, labor organizing, whatever we can do, because we're not anywhere near the strength that we need to be to meet this hypothetical moment given the rules of the game, that the rules that are so fucked up. Um, thanks for this presentation. It was really insightful. <clears throat> Excuse me. I'm, I'm Annie. I teach public school. And I really appreciate what you said about finding issues where we have leverage and where we already have the base to take on some issues. And I, I'm thinking about the issue of teachers being fired mm. for being queer or for raising you know, for teaching black history, and that a lot of these teachers are kind of hung out to dry all on their own. And we just had a teacher here in, in a suburb just north of here, it was a union member, and was fired for wearing a rainbow shirt to school because wow. Moms of Liberty, which is not a grassroots organization, yeah. found out, contacted Fox News, the community was outraged, and she was fired within a week. Wow. And that's in a blue state, that's not Florida. But I feel like we have leverage in this situation because where we have unions, obviously, they should be defending these yes, teachers. Yes. And then where it's also because we have our, people are mostly on our side on these issues, that's the other kind of leverage that we have is that people don't actually support this. It's just not clear what to do all the time. Yeah. And I'm wondering what you think about how we can keep these teachers protected by movement so they don't feel completely isolated when this, these attacks come down. Yeah. 
I mean, I, I thank you so much for that. I think that's another example where you answered your own question, right? It's like, start organizing around that. You have amazing potential. There is a lot of sympathy and have, you know, we need people rallying <laughs> to reinstate these teachers, which is probably what most of the public wants as you, as you described. Um, you know, and, and that's just, it's hard because everybody has life. We have jobs, we have a lot of demands. Um, but I think, you know, that fight is so urgent because the fight over public education is really a fight over our democracy or what little of it exists. And, um, you know, and, and basically I just agree with you. I think that there's un, a lot of untapped potential there and a lot of support and a lot of anger at the bullshit that the right is doing right now um, under the guise of protecting the children. Uh, hi, uh, how's it going? My name's Teek. Uh, I'm a grad worker at Northwestern. We recently uh, unionized, bargaining our first contract. <clears throat> yeah, and I, I'm here with a friend. We're on the bargaining committee. We're learning a lot. Um, and I was just wondering, like, I, I'm just so impressed by so many people here, activists, panelists. It just blows me away, like, how <laughs> dedicated, how much you've accomplished. Um, and you know maybe you're not uh, tireless, but you seem pretty <laughs> relentless, right? Um, and so I'm wondering, like, how you keep the mojo up um, when you know sometimes you just don't feel like <laughs> doing things, or yeah. you have you have personal hang-ups and you're sort of distracted by. Do you have like a list of principles or values that you pull out, <laughs> and you're like, I believe in X, Y, Z, so I'm going to do the thing, even though I like. What do you what do you do? How do you stay so dedicated? That, that's a, yeah. Thanks. Oh. Thanks. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I'll, I'll be quick in case you want to jump in, but just um, my my experience with this has been like this is one of the reasons why kind of it's recruitment above everything, right? Because as tired as I get, I can always get myself to do something if I, you know if I know we have a deep bench, right? And, and, you know, other people as they have energy can, you know, come in and take over things. Um, but, you know, this is, this, is, this is the case against small subcultures because, because you will, there's no, there's no list of principles I can write for myself that will like get over burnout and get over mm -hmm constantly having to be on and uh you know i think um the but besides that the way that i keep myself going is you know just finding winnable tasks right um because um finding a winnable project yeah. because you know that's that's where i get my energy like if if we if we sustain this pace the 30 of us or the 100 of us, we might actually win the thing. You know, I'm, I'm a real schemey guy. I'm not, you know, I like, I, I want to get to the, I want to figure out how to get to the goal, whatever it is. Um, and that will, that will keep me motivated even when I'm, you know, at odds with somebody else who's working on the team or, yeah. you know, something like that. Well, now I know I like Femi so much because I'm always, if in my head, I'm always just, I'm like, I'm a schemer. I love to have schemes too, you know, and I see a scheme pulled off. And I think that that's right. Like you want it to have, you don't want to know you're going to succeed at the scheme, like expropriating the lemonade stand, you know, you want it to have, it, you want it to be challenging. So, when, but you don't want it to be, you don't want to be banging your head against the wall so that you're just bloodied and you haven't gotten anywhere. So I think picking targets where, you know, you can, like unionizing your workplace. You have a chance of maybe doing that, right? And then, then you have to bargain the contract. <laughs> but maybe you can make some progress. That's satisfying. Um, yeah, I think the bench is key. I mean, I think some of, maybe Maddie's in the room from the Debt Collective, other folks. I mean, just being here, we, we don't have a shared space. And so getting to have this time with a few of the folks at the Debt Collective in person and just feeling like, wow, they're so brilliant and so kind and committed and I don't have to do everything. You know, I can step back and, and that, that actually, you know, is so essential to being able to dig in for the long haul because you do have to pace yourself. So this is why it's actually in your self interest to cultivate leadership and power in others and to share power and to share your skills because that's gonna help you be able to sustain this work. Um, 
So I take a lot of, of solace in that. You asked about principles, kind of like a list of principles, and I'm actually, I do have one. <laughs> um, I've got a book coming out in March on solid, it's called Solidarity, the past, present, and future of a world-changing idea that I co-wrote with a friend. And we just were like, we're nerds. The final coda is, a, is the list of virtues, actually, like what we think of as the virtues of solidarity. And I do think we have to consciously cultivate a kind of ethos, right, to keep us going. You know, that this, uh, so yeah, that is part of it, like knowing why you're doing what you're doing. Um, uh, but yeah, virtues, virtues are part of it. Uh, hello, I'm Stephen from Denver, and uh, it was mentioned in a panel yesterday that the number one reason individuals join far-right groups mm -hmm. is a uh, sense of belonging. Mm -hmm. You know, not necessarily if they're you know racist or hold these ideas. You know, maybe that come, maybe they, they're there and they come later. But it made me reflect on my own development. You know, as a leftist radical, like through liberal organizations in the anti-war year. And I think there's a, a tendency on the right, or I'm sorry, on the on the radical left to you know denounce and foreclose on you know liberal understandings and uh, in groups uh, without you know a respect that like we don't always arrive at a radical critique like when we first get into politics, but yeah. it's through observation, yeah. interaction, organizing, and theory. Uh, and so instead of like foreclosure and denouncement, like what is you know a better relationship to that? Uh, focused on recruitment um, and you know supporting people further to the left and if you have any ideas on that yeah I mean I like I said you know I want to be in a radical group that's not just for for radicals and and that you know means yeah so like not I know not everybody agrees with me not everybody's a crazy vegan communist <laughs> you know <laughs> it's like um, and and you know, wherever people are on their journey wanting to help them take the next step, right? Um, and even if somebody is not, you know, ideologically aligned with me, I don't want them to be crushed by medical debt. <laughs> so I'm actually, you know, I'm happy when we provide support that make people's lives more bear bearable and livable, even if they don't totally come into our, you know, if they don't totally drink the Kool-Aid. Um, but I think, you know, you, you mentioned the loneliness and isolation that motivates some people, and I think that's, that is why, if you want to build a resilient organi organization that can take on these asymmetrical fights, like a culture that is kind <laughs> and sees people, helps people feel seen, creates a space where people can talk about some of their shame, <laughs> right? I mean, because this, we live in a society that makes people feel really bad about themselves for being poor and, you know, not being rich. <laughs> um, and uh, which, which isn't to say that we're trying to make like a, a clubhouse where everybody can be friends or something, right? We want, we want to cultivate a kind of camaraderie, but I think that, I think it kind of, helping people feel seen and, and recognized as whole people is like a really essential part of that process and that recruiting. Um, and then if some people, you know, are radicalized at whatever pace, um, then that's great. You know, that, that is our goal, but you, you have to have a big, it's not just enough to have like an open door. You have to really be like actively inviting people in um, and saying, look, I see you, come on in. You know, the Debt Collective is doing this in a very concrete way by actively recruiting older debtors who often feel kind of erased from the discourse, right? You know, and we're saying, are you over 50? <laughs> come on into the Debt Collective, actually. This is a multi-generational space. And as a result, that's our fastest growing caucus. Um, yeah, and so by recognizing people, you can kind of, kind of hook them and, and bring them into a movement. Um, hi, so I'm a student at Lake Forest College. I'm an international student there, and um, I'm really hoping that we can unionize sometime in the next two years. Um, but I have no one on my campus who really <laughs> feels that this is an issue, and so, but I think it's essential to the way we live our lives on that campus. Um, and so I'm kind of wondering if you have any advice. If anyone has any advice, please. I'm the only one in this pink dress. <laughs> Uh, if anyone has any advice, I'd love to take it, but um, how do I like start that movement of like political education and helping people understand why unionization is essential mm -hmm. for us? So, um, I, I, I hope that a lot of people uh, take you up on that because I think there's, you know, a lot of variation campus to campus in terms of, you know, where people are at. Um, but 
you know, when I was signing cards for our unions, the furthest I got was, you know, when I started with what they do understand, mm -hmm. right? So, you know, how are the how are those paychecks, right? Like, <laughs> you know? what what what's the what's the number? Are they coming on time? You know, what's the relationships like in 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 your lab for for the mm -hmm. grad students on the science side of things? You know, uh, with your advisors um, for the grad students on um, for you know the grad student workers on the um, on the like main college side of things, um, and I think starting with the problems that people may not have an analysis of mm -hmm. and and then working through well what is the admin like you know what are the pay rules like who's making those decisions mm -hmm. i think that's how you know i've seen interest increase in jo in signing cards and getting involved with union work Hi there, this has been a wonderful panel. Uh, my name is Alex Lanfear. I'm from Norman, Oklahoma. Um, I'm involved with a group from, called Red Dirt Collective. Um, so a little bit about my backstory. I've only been in the game for about six years now, so I know there's a lot of wonderful minds in here have been involved a lot longer, so maybe y'all can give me some advice. This is part rant, part comment, and part <laughs> solicitation for any help y'all can give me. Um, so I started out with the Democratic Party, and over the years I've gotten pretty... Um, frustrated, cynical about them. And a few years ago, we had a little mini fascist uprising in our town that tried to take over municipal government, and the Democratic Party didn't do anything. Mm. Uh, surprise, surprise. So I got involved with Red Dirt Collective, our local socialist group. Um, one thing that's frustrated me is I have knocked thousands of doors for these candidates, and we collect a lot of data in the uh, VAN app, the Voter Access yeah, Network yeah. app, this is kind of around um, technology, like y'all yeah. mentioned. And what frustrated me is that data just goes away, yeah. like mm -hmm. after we yeah. collect it. Our members have endorsed some of these candidates. I have personally just knocked on my own. Um, and that data is gone. Like, you know, we find out this person is interested in this issue. This person has this problem with housing. But we never get that data back uh, as a group. And then even as a member, of the party, I can't get access to Van unless I pay some kind of fee every month, and they still just won't give it to me unless I'm running a campaign. So I am not a programmer, but I know a little bit of Python, a little bit of SQL. Yeah. I'm trying to build a database for our organization where we get uh, voter information from the state, uh, where we scrape data from the county assessor's office, and we get information from the court records, uh, the state court records uh, website um, on evictions, and so we can combine it all, and we can also put our own information in there. Um, another thing that was frustrating about Van to me is there's uh, phone numbers and email addresses, but they were all decades out of date. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't know how to get that information. I'm wondering if anyone else is doing this work in this room uh, I want to know because I don't want to be beholden to the Democratic Party for this information because it, it is a full force multiplier, like y'all are saying. Yeah. Um, I've been working on this project for about a year. Um, you know, I'm a dad, I'm a husband. I don't have a whole ton of time, but in my free time, I've been trying to develop this. So if anyone else is doing this work, yeah. let me know. Yeah. That's all I got. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Yeah. I. Um, have been remiss as your chair. I apologize. Um, I've been so wrapped up in this conversation that I kind of missed out on the fact that we only have five minutes left. So uh, I just wanted to flag that for us all because people have other meetings they need to go to and other responsibilities. And we also don't want to abuse the time of our speakers. So um, I'm going to uh, just make the, uh, ch the executive decision as a chair to, to abuse my authority our, can we do a lightning round, and then can you do some lightning round responses? So okay. the, the shortest version of your comment or question, comrades, thank you. Yeah, hi, thank you uh, very much. Uh, so I work in a multi-state nonprofit uh, around homeless services. Um, I'm really interested in the critiques of NGOization and, and stuff like that, like a, a, and I want to be open to all that. Um, in my work, I acknowledge that the solutions we administer to reach 
are ostensible goal, they're inadequate, and at worst, they typically reinforce the systems that create homelessness. Uh, nonprofit structures create a division between service providers and service consumers um, that uh, tamp down public power building. And even so, there's a lot of people who actually do want to see homelessness ended in, in nonprofits. Um, so with these tensions, I've been kind of thinking about how to approach like my engagement with that. Uh, and uh, I've been thinking about trying to organize my workplace. I've been trying to, or should I just like go and really focus on tenant organizing? Um, and so I just want to know what, what do you think about nonprofits as sort of a, a site of leverage or struggle um, in the context of sort of asymmetry because there's sort of that risk of co-optation mm. too. So uh, yeah, thank you. Mm. Hi, uh, my name is Tanya Zakerson. Hi, Astra. I'm a trauma surgeon on the south side of Chicago. We've, uh, going back to that legal question, we've recently started a medical legal partnership. My very quick question is, do you think the DEC Collective might be able to teach us how to unionize survivors of firearm injury? Thank you. Ooh, 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 ooh. Hi, I'm Michael. Um, <clears throat> more a comment. Um, Astra, you talked about, <clears throat> excuse me, getting grants for the debt collective and then other times get rejected because um, trustees or their feelings are hurt. And um, it brought to mind a video clip I saw, I think it was last year. I can't remember the context, the setting, it may have been a shareholders meeting for JP Morgan Chase mm -hmm. and, J and um, Jamie Dimon was there. And a woman spoke who was an employee of JP Morgan Chase and she said she barely makes enough money to pay her bills. And Jamie Dimon was, he looked really concerned, he was upset, and he said, and he said something like, oh, oh, I'm really upset about this, and why don't you come talk to me after? And I thought, Jesus Christ, J, J. P. Morgan Chase, the largest bank in the United States, sixth largest bank in the world, sitting on assets of $2 trillion through fractional reserve, um, they can create $20 trillion to do whatever they want with, and, his, and, and Jamie Dimon's a social liberal. He writes these pithy shareholder letters yeah, yeah. every year about income inequality and wealth inequality. And it reminded me also of Anand Giridharadis' book, uh, and also um, The Winners Take All, and mm -hmm. Peter Goodman's book on Davis Men. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they, they talk a good game about caring, but, you know, as he said, their feelings are hurt. We just don't want to hurt their feelings and yeah. ruffle the feathers of this whole system yeah. of capitalism. So anyway, just wanted to bring that up. Yeah, they don't like being called billionaires, yeah. right? God forbid we hurt yeah, their feelings. No. People of billionaireity. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> Yeah, uh, maybe maybe I'll say a little bit about the uh, first question. Um, I think the idea of unionizing nonprofit workers is a really good one, and I think um, maybe you know amongst the core things that unions do, which is fight for working conditions and compensation for the people in them. You know, one of the things that might come out of that in the nonprofit space is a challenge to the decision-making model. And I imagine that there, you know, I, I think there are limits imposed by just what the nonprofit industrial complex is. But even within that, I think um, it's possible to do better at devolving decision making power to the people who are actually affected by the social problems that the nonprofit, that the nonprofits are supposedly there to solve, right? And I think there are some interesting examples of groups that do a better job of actually organizing with the people that they're working with as opposed to on their behalf for something like that. Um, LA Can is, um, you know, you can look them up, but they're a good example of that. Um, so just, just putting out there that I think there are moves to make even within, you know, a uh, complex that ultimately we want to organize out of existence. Okay, very fast. Just to your point about Van, 
you know, one of the we, we're facing many asymmetries: asymmetries of money, asymmetries of time, asymmetry of of data. Is I mean, think about what Jamie Dimon can see in terms of who holds debt <laughs> and who has financial power. A kind of granular detail. And so it's, I think it's really important to think about data in the way that you're thinking about it. And you know, the Democratic Party does not want to organize people. They really don't want yeah. to do anything with that, except get a, just the, the sliver they need to come out to vote, and then they want you to go home. So I think what you're doing is, is really important. And part of why, when, when we build these debt dispute tools at the Debt Collective, we are actually mapping people's financial situations. And for example, with the Tenant Power Toolkit, creating a really detailed map of who the landlords actually are, right? And this is how we're finding out that the, peop the, the leading um, evictors in California and LA County are actually these big national and corporate landlords, right? And this is not information we'd have if we weren't building tools and thinking about data in a critical way. Um, Tanya is, in what is democracy, I've got to say, brilliant um, activist and, and um, uh, a doctor. And you know, I'm just so excited about learning about this possibility. Um, hopefully we could help you organize these folks, but also learn from you. I mean, every constituency is different in terms of, you know, not just the sort of psychology of folks that you're trying to organize into some kind of collective or union formation, but also thinking about who, who they're targeting. So that would be one question for me, you know, who are we organizing against to, to get some kind of um, uh, reparations, some kind of um, uh, results from, but, um, you know, I think there are also people in the debt collective, for example, who spent years building unions of the homeless, and that might be relevant experience. And I think, to me, I'm like unions everywhere, right? <laughs> Whatever collective formations, I mean, labor unions are absolutely critical, but, um, but I'd be extremely interested in, in talking further, but I think it's a good example of just thinking creatively, what kinds of people can we organize so that they're not alone, and so that they have power, and so they can fight these asymmetrical battles? So thanks again to Olufemi Taiwo and Astra Taylor for the excellent conversation. Please check out their books and uh, come to the Haymarket Book Room to, to get those uh, titles.